Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm David Robinson, the senior minister here at Community Christian Church. And in recent weeks around here, we've been exploring several characters from the Bible, uh, people who really faced extremely difficult circumstances, ones that weren't wanted. You know, they, they were thrust upon them, and yet they weren't overwhelmed by them. You know, they came out on the other side standing firm and standing strong and standing steady and full of hope. In a lot of ways, they were better than before. And we're looking at their example to figure out, you know, how do they do it? What can we learn from them? Because we too, collectively, are facing quite the challenge, one that no one chose. It was thrust upon us. And if we're not careful, we could be swept away by it. And none of us wants to be defeated. We want to stand firm. We want to be found full of hope right here, right now. Well, today's character is one of the most amazing guys in the Bible, one of the most courageous and resilient people that we come across in the Bible. And let's figure out why he was that way. His name is Daniel. And when we first meet Daniel, he's probably about 16 years old. It's about 605 BC. And he's just finished his sophomore year of high school. And he's described as this young, handsome, physical specimen of a guy. He's He's smart, he's teachable, he, he loves God. He's got a bright, bright future ahead of him. And then a funny thing happens on the way to the future for Daniel. Uh, none of it plays out how he expects. Uh, the very first verse, uh, the very first chapter of the book of Daniel in the Bible says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So Daniel's at home one day and he hears boots on the ground and it's the Babylonians. Now, Babylon, it was the world power in that day. And the Babylonians form of conquering was to just go in and desolate an area. I mean, just raise it to the ground in a lot of ways. And then they would cart off the brightest and the best back to Babylon. And Daniel watches as the place that's familiar to him and loved by him just crumbles to the ground, goes up in smoke along with his family, along with everything about his future, everything. It's just, it's gone. And the king behind the whole plan of destruction and deportation and captivity and exile, it's a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was a king with this huge ego and an audacious plan to overcome the entire world. And he drags Daniel and a whole bunch of others back to this Babylon, which is about 500 miles away from them, what is modern day Iraq to us. Literally, Daniel finds himself between Iraq and a hard place. All right, now Iraq, Babylon, it's a stark contrast to Israel, this little farming community, this uh, grazing pasture land. Babylon is this fast-paced place where there's lots of hubbub of culture and wealth and, and wickedness, too. I mean, this is sort of New York City or, or, or Vegas kind of a place where you can find anything you want, good or bad. And Daniel and his friends, they know, you know, they're not in Kansas anymore. They're in exile. Daniel is in exile. And he gets drafted to be a part of this special group of cadets for a school kind of thing. Verse 3 tells us, Then the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. All right. So they're looking for the Steve Jobs or the Albert Einsteins or the Tony Starks, you know, of their world. And they're going to convert them. They're going to teach them language and literature from the Babylonians. They're going to enculturate them. They're going to strip away and brainwash them and get them away from their own culture so they, they can become Babylonians and contribute to the empire. And this is something that Daniel never expected. I mean, he didn't expect to end up in Babylon. I mean, you try to picture Daniel in your mind. He was one of the bright, 
brightest and best of Israel. And, and we know a fair amount about what this picture would have looked like from verses three and four. He, he was from a family of high social status. He was physically flawless. He was strikingly handsome. You know, he, he would be the, on The Bachelor in our day. You know, everyone would want a rose from Daniel. You know, if an angel and a pirate had a baby, imagine that. That's Daniel. Daniel was bright. He was quick to understand. It says he was qualified to serve in the king's palace, which means he had a high level of what we might call emotional intelligence. He had some people smarts. You know, he could, he could read and assess a room. And he was devoted to God and God's community. And he would have all the dreams that a young man like that would have. I mean, back in his home of Judah, his future would have been quite predictable. I mean, the whole world was in front of him. He'd go to a great school and then go on to glittering success, you know, whatever field he chose, make a great marriage, live in an enviable home, raise a wonderful family, occupy a prominent place in the temple. He'd do great things for God and God's people. You know, but life didn't turn out that way. There's a whole world of heartbreak in those first two verses. Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Daniel, this 15-year-old, watches as Nebuchadnezzar, with very little effort, destroys Daniel's world. I mean, Daniel would come to adulthood and spend his life in a foreign land. He gave his best service to an alien king. And he lost his culture. He lost the relationships he cherished. He would have to speak a foreign language. He, he would live and die in a place that he never wanted to be. He'd never go home. He even loses his name. And his name, it's quite significant. You, you see in verse 7 where Daniel and his three friends are each given new names there. We read the chief official gave them names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego, okay? Now, each of their old names, their Hebrew names, had a reference to God in it, all right? Either the little syllable El for Daniel or Mishael from Elohim or the syllable Yah, Hananiah, Azariah, from Yahweh. Their names reminded them that they belonged to God. And the new name that Nebuchadnezzar gave, it was his way of saying, you know, you belong to me now. You have a new king. Give yourself to me. Allow Babylon to define your identity. You know, the name Daniel meant the Lord will judge. It's a great name. The Lord will be my judge. And so every time Daniel had heard his name spoken, it was a reminder, the Lord will set things right. The Lord will see that justice is done. But now he's not Daniel anymore. And so it doesn't seem like the Lord is setting things right. So what do you do when you end up in Babylon? I mean, Babylon is where you find yourself when life doesn't turn out the way you planned. Maybe it happens when a relationship that you had such dreams for, it just ends. Maybe it happens when your greatest vocational dream dies. Maybe it happens when somebody that you knew and loved wounds you very deeply. Maybe it's when you realize that a deep prayer that you cherished, it'll never be answered the way that you want it to. You find yourself in Babylon cut off from the life that you wanted and planned for, and you may never get home. And worst of all, you wonder if God even knows. I mean, how could God let this happen? Has he forgotten you? Does he even notice? What do you do when you find yourself like Daniel in Babylon? Well, there's a whole field in the social sciences that involves the study of people who experience suffering, major crisis, or trauma. Now, these researchers, they studied POWs from the Korean War and POWs from the Vietnam War and the 52 hostages that were held 14 months in Iran. And these studies find that, as you might expect, a lot of people are just defeated by difficult ordeals, just wither in their spirit. But interestingly enough, there are some people who don't just survive these traumatic events they actually enlarge their capacity to handle problems and strengthen their ability to persist and endure and, and be creative and be tenacious so that at the very end, they haven't just survived, they've grown. They've actually grown on trauma. And researchers call these folks resilient. And they find that there are certain common characteristics, you know, qualities of spirit that tend to mark resilient people. When we turn to Daniel, we look at one of the most spiritually resilient persons in human history. 
I mean, at the beginning of his life, he lost everything. Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. And yet, with God's help in Babylon, Daniel learned not just to survive, but thrive. How? I mean, how does he hold up? It might be the most important characteristic to kind of grab onto in Daniel's life. Uh, but one thing that he did and one thing that spiritually resilient people do is they resolve. They make a deep decision, a determination to honor their deepest values. You know, they refuse to live as passive victims of circumstances that are kind of beyond their control. They refuse to get tangled up in stuff that would cause them to betray their deepest commitments. They resolve to honor their deepest values, to honor God. Now, a lot of people talk about honoring their values and honoring God with their life. But a lot of times, how they live, the way people behave, the way people act, the way of their lives, it doesn't reflect their values, but not Daniel. And in many ways, verse 8 is, is the hinge point. Chapter 1, verse 8, it's the hinge point of the whole story. And in some ways, of the entire book of Daniel, everything turns right there. Because up until verse 8, it's the Babylonians who have determined everything. I mean, up until this point, they've been in the driver's seat. Nebuchadnezzar determines to conquer Israel. Nebuchadnezzar determines to cart off his most safe, its most sacred objects and its highest potential citizens. Nebuchadnezzar determines to enroll them in his leadership academy. Nebuchadnezzar determines on the entrance criteria, the subject matter. The dean of the school determines their names, their new identities, and the menu. They'll be fed this rich food and wine from the king's table. And the easiest thing in the world would have been for Daniel to feel like he's just a passive victim of forces that are way too big for him. It would be so easy for Daniel just to mail it in right there. But from verse 8 on, the initiative in the story shifts. And the writer shows this in a really, really colorful way. You see, the same verb gets repeated three times. It's important to pay attention to when the same word gets repeated in a, in a section of the Bible. And a kind of literal rendering of verse 7 would be this. The chief of staff determined new names for them. He determined on Belteshazzar for Daniel and, and so on. So there's that, that verb, determine. But then verse 8, Daniel determined not to defile himself with rich food. It's, it's the same verb repeated over and over, but this time Daniel is determining. Daniel the captive, Daniel the prisoner, Daniel makes a decision. And the writer uses a real strong word for that decision. It could be translated, Daniel resolved in his heart that he would honor God. He would not defile himself. He just decides. He resolves. And now he's got to take some action. And so he goes to the dean of the school to talk about the menu. And he explains that everybody is being fed all this, you know, meat and such from the king's table. You know, everybody's being fed roast beef and eggs and cheese and that. They're on the meat lover's plan. And he's a veggie kind of guy, you know. They're on the Atkins diet. And he's a slim fast kind of guy. Now, the Bible doesn't say why this food would defile Daniel. I mean, maybe it violate some sort of ceremonial law. Maybe it was offered to idols because it was from the king's table. It's not real clear why, but it is clear that Daniel, he needed to draw a line. He needed to take a stand. And we need to grasp how much courage this took on Daniel's part. Nebuchadnezzar was not the kind of leader who cut people a lot of slack. In fact, if he was displeased with you, I mean, he'd just kill you. If he didn't like you, he would kill you. If you crossed him or disappointed him, he would just kill you. You know, you, you've heard of leaders with hands-on management style or hands-off management style. Nebuchadnezzar had a heads-off management style. I mean, if people crossed him, he cut their heads off. But Daniel determines something. Daniel remembers his name. Daniel does not view himself as a helpless pawn of circumstances. Daniel resolves in his heart. And there's just this magnificent courage an initiative here, and then we'll see a lot of wisdom behind it. And spiritually resilient people are that way. They resolve that they're going to honor God wherever they find themselves, whatever their circumstances are. And then they figure out whatever it takes to do that. And they don't accept as an excuse that they live in forces that are, that are way powerful beyond their control. They seize whatever initiative is available to them. Now, this is going to take some effort on Daniel's part here. 
he goes to the dean of the school and kind of makes his request. And the dean says, well, listen, if I say yes to you, if I don't feed you the food from the king's table, if I do put you on the veggie plan, then you're going to end up looking weak and you'll lack a bunch of energy. And then the king will have my head. That's his answer. And then we start to see uh, Daniel's persistence and initiative and just kind of street smarts that come out because Daniel says to himself, well, it's not exactly a yes and it's not exactly a no. And so he goes to the guard at the next level down on the org chart and he proposes an experiment. He says, hey, how about we just try this veggie diet for 10 days and then you just judge us. You just compare us to the other guys. In fact, that's exactly what happens. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So Daniel here, he exercises amazing initiative, courage, and faith that God will work. And God does. In fact, we see in verse 16 that the guard is so impressed with what happens to Daniel and his friends that he takes everybody's steak away and puts the whole school on the veggie platter plan. And Daniel ends up going to the head of the class. He becomes the valedictorian there. But gang, this only happens because when everything looked like it was lost and he was up against very powerful forces, Daniel resolved in his heart that he wouldn't get tangled up with anything that would cause him to betray his deepest values. He resolved in his heart that he would honor God no matter what. So let me ask you, is there anywhere that you're getting tangled up in life with something that doesn't honor God? Ken Davis, he tells a story about a time that there was this incident that happened at a traffic light near the edge of his town. A man was revving the engine of his huge Harley Davidson motorcycle as he waited for the light to change. And he was a real intimidating guy, this Harley rider. You know, he had a leather jacket, no sleeves, uh, images of skulls and bones kind of leered from his clothing and bare forearms. And his bike, it bore the emblem of a menacing black widow spider. And as he waited at the light, an elderly man on a lime green moped pulled up beside him. And the older man, he said, boy, that's some motorcycle you got there. Do you mind if I take a closer look? And the, you know, the Harley rider, he said, whatever, old timer. And the old man's eyesight, it wasn't what it used to be. And so he leans in real far near the bike to examine all the scenery. And his face is right over the bike there. And looking up after a while, he says to the biker, he says, I bet this thing is fast. But no sooner were the words out of his mouth and the light changed and the Harley rider just guns it. He gave it full throttle. And within a matter of seconds, the Harley was, you know, it was like a rocket, zero to 60 in no time. And then suddenly he noticed a dot in his rear view mirror, a dot that was growing larger. You know, something was gaining on him. And so he slowed down to get a better look. And whatever the thing was, it just flashed right past him so fast he couldn't even identify it. And and it disappeared over the horizon and it whipped back around and came right back past him. And as it zipped past him, he recognized the rider. It was the old man on the lime green moped. The biker, he took another look into his rearview mirror and there was that speck again, kind of growing larger and larger. And he tried to outrun it, but he couldn't. And it didn't matter anyway, because in just a couple of seconds time, the moped slammed into the rear of that Harley Davidson. And the collision, it just destroyed both bikes. Well, uh, eventually when the dust settled, the biker was able to get himself up from the mess. And what had once been his beloved Harley Davidson, it was now just a mangled steel pretzel there. But the old man had fared even worse. He, He lay groaning beneath the wreckage and just the smoking remnants of his moped. And the biker was just moved with compassion. And he knelt beside the old man's face and softly asked him, Is there anything I can do for you? And the old man, he he very delicately replied. He said, yes. Could you please unhook my suspenders from your handlebars? (laughs) It's a very vivid image, isn't it? This is what Ken Davis goes on to write. He says, you and I would never purposely hook our suspenders to anything dangerous. 
And yet many of us might be willing to lean over for a closer look. The world around us, he says, is littered with the mangled lives of men and women who never intended to get hooked. They only wanted to get a closer look at the shiny colors of some dangerous, damaging path. We get tangled up in Babylon. I mean, so many people never intended to sabotage a marriage or a relationship or a friendship. They just drift into it. They drift into resentment or bitterness or revenge. And they suffer a relational train wreck and it's destroying their heart. And some of you are seeing yourselves as helpless victims of pawns of circumstances and decisions other people made. And God is calling you to be like Daniel. Make a resolution in your heart that will take courage and wisdom to carry out. But you can do this. And it's required for spiritual resiliency. It's required if you're going to survive and thrive in Babylon. And I'll tell you a secret, CCC. All of us live in Babylon. So many people say, I would get to know God better, or I would get involved in some ministry, or I would live with authentic joy, or I would build into the life of another person, or I would seize life and live it the best I can, if only, you know, if only I had a better situation, if only I had a better family, if only I had a better small group leader, if only other people had made different choices, if only my season of life weren't so demanding. You see, we all live in Babylon. We all live in a world that will try to tempt us or intimidate us for settling less than God's best. Listen, gang, this is your one and only life. And this is your day. This is your week. This is your month. Even in a pandemic, this is your month. So what do you need to resolve in your heart? I mean, do you need to end a relationship that's dishonoring God? Well, end it. Make the call. Do it today. Do you need to repent of some sort of uh, immoral or unethical practice you're involved in? Well, repent and set things right. Do it now. Do you need to seek first the kingdom of God by reordering your time and your, your priorities? Well, reorder them. Is there some area in your life where you need to pursue healing? And I mean, you haven't been doing it because you've been seeing yourself as a victim. Well, just determine. I'm going to pursue healing right now. Do it today. I mean, this is your day and this is your life. And you and I, we got to resolve in our lives, in our hearts, deep in our souls. And I'll tell you why so much is at stake here. In the future, Daniel and his friends would have to make some very, very difficult decisions. And there was one point where they were commanded to bow down and worship the king or be thrown into a furnace. And they said, okay, throw us into the furnace because we're not going to bow. When Daniel's told one day, cease praying to your God or you'll be thrown to the lions. And Daniel says, all right, throw me to the lions because I'm not going to stop praying. See, if Daniel and his friends hadn't drawn the line here in chapter one, had not declared to the world and themselves where their deepest allegiance belong, they'd never have had the strength to face the furnace or the lions then. Uh, Some of you have hooked your suspenders up to the wrong thing. And you're feeling a little bit of pain right now. And if not, you will. You resolve this day, I'm going to honor God. I will not hand over this one and only life that God has given me to any power in Babylon, not to any person, not to any relationship, not to any job, not to any boss, not to any habit, not to any force, not to any schedule. I'll resolve in my heart that I will honor God. One place Daniel found a great deal of strength and led to his resolve was that he wasn't alone in the middle of it. He had this community. It kind of helped forge this resolve in him. He had a little small group of sorts. You know, if you read there in chapter 1 and 2, he had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were really kind of a little small group for him. They, they would go to this school together. They surely studied and, and prayed and faced decisions together. They'd one day face the furnace together. They would eventually help rule together. I mean, this one small group of devoted followers of God would change the course of the most powerful nation on earth. And part of what we learn from Daniel's story is that when you live in Babylon, you will not survive and thrive if you're on your own. You just won't. We need people who encourage us consistently, people who pray for us continually, people who challenge us when we get off track, people who inspire us to fully give ourselves to the Lord. They say, don't give up, don't give in. And Daniel had that and it fortified his resolve and helped lead to his resiliency. 
And maybe above it all, I mean, Daniel had developed this eternal perspective, you see. He knew that even the difficulty that he faced had meaning and purpose in the eyes of God. And this is real interesting to me. Researchers say that, that the factor that causes people to give up most often is not when their suffering gets more intense. It's when they believe their suffering has no meaning or purpose. It's not the intensity of the suffering. It's the meaninglessness of it. You see, Daniel, he discovers something in Babylon that he would never have known if he, he lived his whole life in Israel like he planned. He, he discovered that there was somebody who was at work in Babylon. There, there's one character in the story besides Daniel and his friends and Nebuchadnezzar and his servants. I mean, see if you can spot his name here. And we'll do this kind of backwards. Uh, I'll start with verse 17. See if you can find the character whose name keeps getting repeated in this first chapter in these, first, in these verses here. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And then you look at verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. And then you look at verse 2. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. I mean, who's the character that keeps getting mentioned? It's God. The writer of this story is convinced that God is at work right from the start. He knows what many of the Israelites did not know. He's convinced that even the defeat of Israel and the loss of the temple that looks so tragic, it wasn't just, you know, a random meaninglessness event. God was not asleep. God hadn't broken his promises. God hadn't forgotten his dream. God was up to something in Babylon in a place of great suffering. God, as it turns out, loved even Babylon. God, as it turns out, cares about old Nebuchadnezzar, sees something in him. And Daniel is able to see God at work even in Babylon. He has this eternal perspective. Daniel had trained his eyes to see God at work in the most discouraging of all situations. He found that God was at work in Babylon, and we need to do the same. I and mean, we see this especially in chapter 2, how Daniel holds to this eternal view continually looking for God. I'd encourage you to read chapter two of Daniel and we'll make sense of it next week. We'll spend a couple of weeks on Daniel here. But, but we're tempted because Daniel's name is on this book to think that the main character in the book of Daniel is Daniel. I mean, understand how we can get there. But the main character in Daniel is not Daniel. It turns out it's God. God's actually the main character in all the books of the Bible. And so the question we got to ask is, how's God working? in the life of Daniel. And we need to ask that question for us too. How's God working now in our life, in our situation? Because whatever you suffer this day or sometime in the future, God is there too. And he's very much at work, even if it doesn't feel like it at the time, even if you can't seem to make sense of it or sense him. You, you know, Daniel had latched on to the parts of his faith that could go with him in Babylon. I think this is important. You know, the, the parts that were portable in his faith. I mean, he couldn't go to the temple. I mean, it's destroyed now. He couldn't go offer sacrifices like was his custom. You know, Ju Jerusalem, where they'd offer sacrifices, was destroyed. But he still prayed. That ends up getting him in trouble in chapter 6. And he still worships. And we see that clearly in chapter 2. And he still looks for and seeks God and his kingdom, even in Babylon, even in exile. And I think we find ourselves in a similar situation, just like Daniel. I mean, we can't engage and practice our faith the way that we're used to. With strict social distancing in place, we can't gather in this building, in this room right here like we want to. Because, you know, mask wearing and six foot distancing and no no singing and temperature taking and no children's ministry and no passing communion trays. And, I mean, all of that. And the surveys are, are, are showing most folks wouldn't even show up if we tried. It feels like exile. It feels like Babylon. And in the midst of it, we need to resolve. We need to latch onto the parts and practices that are portable, that we can engage in. And we need to keep that eternal perspective that God is still at work. Even now, God is still near. You see, we got to know God was with Daniel. And in what seemed like a God-forsaken place, he became the highest advisor to the king and the most powerful nation of earth. And God is with you too. Whoever you are, whatever Babylon we're facing, whatever Babylon you find yourself in, God is up to something there. So you resolve to honor him.
Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you today that you're always at work, no matter what. Would you fortify our faith and would you encourage our hearts today and all this week? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, thanks again for tuning in today. I hope you have just a fantastic week and we'll see you right back here. Same bat time, same bat channel, everybody. <laughs> Got it stuck right above it. <laughs> I don't think I could do that again if I tried it a hundred times. <laughs> That's a better shot than if I hit the camera.